are here today with Arnisha Royston. Thank you so much, Arnisha, for coming in. I'm excited to be here, to be on the podcast. Yes, it's about time. To, yeah, it's it's been a long time coming. Yes, well, happy Friday. Long short, yeah. Happy Friday to you, too. I forgot that today is Friday. Yes, happy Friday. I, I felt like last night was a Friday night. I was sort of going to bed late and hanging out and yeah. forgot we had to be here this morning. Exactly. Be here at 8 a.m. and start the day. But it's good. We have a long weekend, so... What do you What do you have going this weekend? I don't. I need. I I have to really buckle down and crack in on in doing some editing and revising. So I'm gonna allocate this time to doing that to getting it done. Which is not fun plans, but it's something I I need to do to stay on track. Is this your own work? Yeah, my oh, own that's... writing. So I need to get quite a bit of editing and revising out of the way. So so the unfun part of writing. Yeah, that's. Uh, it's kind of fun though. No. Yeah, I think I I get so much in my head about it about like. Sometimes what you write originally is like, I feel like that's the core. And if I change too much of it, I'm losing the essence of what I originally wanted to say. So for me, it's like a battle between mm -hmm. keeping what I originally wrote there and like allowing the work to be what it needs to be. So I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you're in a totally different frame of mind when you come to a piece as an editor versus just the writer and you're almost spilling out your subconscious as you're writing exactly. and then if you come back and put your rational thinking cap on it sort of messes things up a little exactly. bit exactly and then if you're like taking in feedback from other people also so it's it's i don't know i don't i don't think of it as fun but i know it's work that needs to to get done to have the best product now, now that's tough too is when you ask people for feedback because you have to really trust that person or those people because their input can matter a lot and help you with your writing. But at the same time, it could, if you listen to them too much, it could screw things up a bit. Yeah. I, I agree with that so much. I, I think I have like a reader now that I feel so comfortable with sharing my work, but I was talking with, um, I think I was talking, to, it was either Miss Knapp or Miss Royals about like writing and how a part of this fellowship is to like, have a, a to to build a strong writing community. So I'm attempting to get back out there and like ask people to be readers. But like you're saying, it's it's tough to like want to trust someone with your work and that they're gonna give you good feedback because you're not always sure. So I'm I'm always looking for great readers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I I would love to know a little bit about your process, your writing process, and. I was going to, if I was brave enough during the assembly, this was the question I was going to raise my hand and ask the people up there last yeah. week when you had the faculty writers. Uh, but I'm so curious about people's process and when is a good time for them to write. And, you know, you've got this fellowship where you have different days set aside for your own writing. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about what needs to happen for you on those days for you to really spit out good poetry? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I think the answer varies for me a lot. But I think right now, like when I think of my writing process, a lot of it is dependent upon reading, like what am I reading and how am I being influenced by what I'm reading? Because when you think about writing, all writing is like imitation in some form. And in no way am I saying like walking the line of plagiarism or, or anything mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that, but to be inspired by, by what you're reading. So for me, a lot of my setup to write is reading, right? Reading at, at different levels. But when I think of <laughs> the writing process, I'm, I'm trying, do you write by hand or when you write or do you write more like on a laptop? No, I've, since I I've been writing short stories. I've been tinkering with short story writing uh, recently and I like writing that on the computer yeah. because I can get more down. But when I try to write poetry, I like doing it by hand because there's something about the pen in your hand and the subconscious mind spilling out that you don't get with the computer yeah. as an intermediate or, or, you know, something in between. There's, so, there's something tactile that's different about writing versus typing there. I completely agree with you. And for so long, for me, it was like writing on my laptop because I get so anal about like how the poem looks on the page, like making it like making its form while I write. But now when I think of writing process, I'm trying to come to the page first. So sometimes it's just me jotting an idea down. Like it was Val Valentine's February. I really like wanted to write a love poem this month. So throughout, I carry around like a notebook with me. So I'll just jot down mm -hmm. notes in it. And 
I think it's different than you because you you said like for poetry you come to the page and you can write and it kind of just flows out for me when I'm handwriting I, I feel a lot of blocks I'm not sure why but I'll just take a lot of notes and then eventually taking what I've read throughout the week the notes that I wrote I'll pick like one day and like kind of pull all of those different pieces mm -hmm. together in attempt to to write a poem so how about when you're stuck and you're sitting down and looking at the blank page which is the greatest fear, the biggest fear, the biggest enemy for a writer. What are your go-tos in order to get something down? Are there tricks or yeah. there tips that you have just to get the words down? These these may not work for other people, but but for me, I will shift to like doing something else creative or like something that's going to inspire me creatively. I have a writing playlist, so I'll go to my writing playlist and think of a song, and maybe I'll pull one lyric and I'll write it, write that lyric down. Not saying that that's going to be in the poem at all, but sometimes physically writing something down on the page is getting the, the juices going mm -hmm. for me. Or if I've been doing some amazing reading this week and I'm like, I just need to feel inspire, inspired, I'll go back and just reread <laughs> something again. But Sometimes, honestly, like when I just like can't get anything on the page, I'll stop writing. I'll just like walk away from it and come back maybe an, an hour later or maybe two days later. I think for me, writing has always like worked because I mean, there's times where I do pressure myself, but but for the most part, I I try to let the words come when they want to come. Mm -hmm. The hardest for me is like when they're not coming and, and being able to just like step away. So. Those are some tools that I use, but I don't know. What about you? I think I have to, for, to become in that creative space that we're talking about, that flow state, I need to have some exercise. Like if yeah. I go for a run, if I lift weights, if I go to yoga and I come back and I start to write, I've got much clearer thoughts and better ideas than I would if I just woke up, you know, went to lunch, came home yeah. and started writing. So for me, it's all about, endorphins maybe I don't know what that is but even going on a walk going on a long walk and coming back and writing is helpful I took this class at Breadloaf this summer this past summer uh where we did Tai Chi and it was like a Tai Chi poetry class with Ruth Foreman wow. and uh she would have us out there at first it was really weird it was like you know Tai Chi what are these people doing what am I signing up for but she had this really strong belief in energy work that I, that I buy into. And I think, you know, if you do something that gets the energy going and then you sit down and try to transfer that onto the blank page, it's a lot more seamless, I think, than yeah. without that. I agree. I think, I don't know why, but I'm thinking of when, when you and I had that writing session last semester where we came, we came into the space to write. So I think sometimes setting aside, like... Mm -hmm a set time to write, even though we, we came into that space not knowing like what we would write or what we would write about, but we both walked away with something on the page. And I think like doing things like Brett Loaf or even like with just two people like, hey, we're gonna write for an hour during this time, yep. or I'm gonna go to this writer's workshop for the summer and, and do some writing. So I don't know. Yeah, that's something that I've always been anxious or stressed about is the timer maybe in yeah. school like you're taking a time test or doing the SAT you've got to do it in this amount of time but I found it helpful recently sitting down with someone and saying all right let's write for 30 minutes and it sort of forces you to get something down on the paper and that's really what matters I mean if it's good or not is a second thought yeah it's really about just getting something down yeah, that was actually, I never told you, but that was really good for me. I was in such a writer's funk at that time. Like, I hadn't been, been writing as much as I said, should. And we did that, and I, I remember we set some guidelines, like, write a poem that turns, write a poem, like, about place. And, like, those things end up becoming thematic threads in, like, the, the next couple of poems I wrote. So I know for sure that's something that I need to do more. Like, set a time. 30 mm -hmm. minutes you and I are going to write or with someone. It's such a fruitful tool that, as a writer, I hadn't used as much as I should have. Yeah, yeah, because I, I don't think people want to use the clock. Like, the clock is scary. But, yeah, like you said. like. But it helps. It yeah. helps. And sometimes writing with people can be intimidating. Like, looking over and seeing, like, I'm like, Jake has a whole, <laughs> whole page already, and I'm, like, stuck. So, but I think it's a communal writing is important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I write with this guy who was a longtime teacher at St. Paul's in Loyola down the street, and um, he's a bread loaf guy too. And sometimes I'll meet up with him at a coffee shop and just work on some writing. And he's been on the podcast. His name's Edward. Um, he and I like will put 30 minutes on the clock, write as much as you can, and then exchange and see what each other have written. And that's tough because yeah. it's like you just wrote for 30 minutes. It's not very good. Now I've got to show someone else. Um, you've got to be really open and trusting of that other yeah. person, I think. Do you feel like it changes, like, what you write then? Like, when you do, a, uh, when you do like, a community writing where you know for sure you're not going to share what you write versus when you do your writing with Edward and you're, you know you're going to share at the end, do you feel like you write differently in those spaces? Um, I don't think so. I think... It... I think I trust him enough, and I also think that since we're writing fiction, yeah. and fiction is, and short stories are sort of freeing because it's like this can be based on your own life and your own experiences, but it can also not be. Yeah. And that's almost the fun part of it for me, writing, is taking things that I've experienced and lived through and changing them and yeah. exaggerating them and making stuff up and who cares who reads it then you know it's not really about you yeah I think that's an important outlook to have that I think people have gotten away from that in, in writing a little bit so I think it's important that that's still an important um, thing that you look forward to when you write and as someone who doesn't write as much like fiction based um, writing as I probably should um, I think that's important and something that I want to take away into my own writing. So what is it about poetry for you? Like what attracts you to poetry over a different form? I think like uh, I, that's a great question and I think a question that I've attempted to answer a lot myself. I think I came from like my mom was like very much into like journaling and writing your feelings down and, and stuff like that as a way to like just cope with life you know mm -hmm. she believed in that a lot and like setting intentions through writing and and stuff like so that's the, the background I'm coming from like as a child so I, I had that so much that I'm, I'm journaling all of my life and and just I guess what I'm trying to say is I think it's like the closest to the way that I've been taught to kind of cope with life to to like write through something and I think poetry allows me to do that because Poetry can be very restricting, right? Like, it can be very restricting. You can say, like, you have to write a sonnet or you have to write in this meter or that. But but what I love about poetry is that it's extremely freeing because the form is so wide. It's so, so vast. So I can take that background of, like, writing through something and put it into, like, something that can be, like, confined or larger. So very long-winded way. Of, of saying that I think I write poetry because it constricts me in the most freeing way, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's, there's something about if I'm writing through an experience or something narrative-based, putting it on the paper but saying like, I'm going to use couplets or I'm going to use this or, or that. And I think I, I talked about this a little bit in my assembly back in January. I think so much of writing poetry for me is like chasing my own voice, like, the things that I can't always say out loud or, or that I don't feel like I have the power to say, I could say it in a, in a poem, like, and in, in be a little bit more free. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think, I, I think that's why I, I write, po I think it's an ongoing, ongoing question yeah. of like, why, but I love it. I love to read poetry and I think it's amazing. And it's just something you could push up against, you know, like it's, uh, some people might say, like, the academic essay is limiting. But I think as English teachers, we could push against that. But, like, poetry to me is just, like, it can be anything, anything you need it to be. I always teach that on the first day of my creative writing class. Like, here's what Webster says poetry is, but, like, here's all the things that it can be. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, it's what you need it to be when you're writing it. Yeah, I really like that. And you use the word voice or chasing your voice. And that's an idea I've been trying to work with my students this year. They're juniors. You know, I think, I think it's great to be able to write an analytical essay, and I think analytical thinking skills are some of the best skills you teach in school. But I almost think to our AI discussion today and 
specifically the junior year leading up to college, you've got to develop a personal voice, right? Yeah. You're going to write a college essay soon, and that's becoming more and more important. You know, for, for better or worse, that's what our students are trying to do here is get into a college. Exactly. And yeah. if they can't, if they don't know what that means, if they don't know what voice means, they, they're going to struggle with writing an essay. So I've been trying to work on that concept of chasing your voice all year. And it's sort of hard to communicate to someone what that means. It's almost a skill or it's almost something that happens with osmosis with reading. It's like you read enough that you have a sense of what voice is. But for other students who are like, what is the formula to getting an A in your class, man? Exactly, yeah. I'm just like, I can't tell you exactly. There's no rubric for voice. I think, I don't know, and this might be like a little odd, but I think it goes back to like coming up as someone who journaled a lot, like writing. I think journaling can be a lot of different things, but like writing to myself, like from myself, I think I was like, I took away like the pressure of like writing for class or writing for this, like in low stakes writing, like to take it to like academic terms where you're just like writing to the page, I think more than, than, than often your own voice comes up. But sometimes I think what I'm hearing you saying, even in low stakes writing, students are still like, all right, you're telling me to do, to do this, but let's talk about rubric. Let's talk about how you're going to, Mm -hmm. to grade this, this assignment. So I think that's the, the part that then becomes hard. Like, how can I get a student to, to see that? Like, I'm just asking you to, to, to write your, your own voice. So, mm-hmm. and I tried to describe it to a student yesterday and I asked her, have you ever written a rant in a text message to someone? And I feel like I do that sometimes. Like I'll write a long text message ranting about something. Yeah. And my real voice sort of comes out there because there's emotion behind it. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. And that's why I'm trying to give them prompts uh, where they write about something they care about. You know, if you write about something you really, really care about and you have emotion about, your voice sort of comes out. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, in creative writing, you know, it's very important to have your own voice. And and I'm getting the students as seniors, they've, they've done a lot of writing. So I always, like, my first, like, creative writing assignment is always to do, like, an imitation of an author, which can be hard when we're thinking about finding your own voice because I I did a, um, always teach this poem called Venus and Flytraps by uh, Yusuf Komiyaka, where the author is writing from the perspective of a five-year-old child. But when I asked him to do the imitation, it's pick your own age and pick your own experience and, and write through that. And sometimes through through that imitation of like what another author is doing, they're able to like, you'll be so surprised like how many poems that I get with the same imitation, but completely different voices, completely different like experiences. And I think for me, without telling them, that's how I'm hoping that they're like beginning to find their own voice as writers. Mm-hmm. That That's my hope, but I'm not sure if it always happens, but I think it, more often than not, it does. I think so. I think it's because you have that rule that those confines of choosing an age and writing through that, like without, without those confines, there'd be too much freedom. Exactly. So it's a delicate balance. Yeah. To like figure out. It's one of, I think teaching that poem is like one of my favorites. And, and I think a lot of people don't know Yusuf Komiyaka's work as much anymore. So it's nice to like funnel that through and like I think students like enjoy that that writing as a tool to like write through their own experiences so it's I think it's interesting because I'm in creative writing and you're teaching junior English but our goals are the same for students to like find themselves through them right through their writing or not themselves even if it's just like a part of their voice so Mm -hmm. it's great yeah and I think uh something else that I'd like to hear your thoughts on is just the idea of writing something that's interesting, you know, whether that's an exaggerated part of yourself or your experience, but to the reader, it must be interesting. I think is very simple, you know, such a simple point, but so important. And it's almost like during the Super Bowl, you know, the companies that advertise 
during the Super Bowl are paying $7 million or whatever for those 30 seconds of airtime. And as you're watching, like th- their job is to catch your attention and bring you in and make you enjoy those 30 seconds. You know, and I feel like you're almost doing the same thing as a writer is catch the reader, bring them into the story, make them enjoy that experience, and that's it. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about that? Always, when you think about what captures you in reading or what makes you say, like, oh, my God, this is a great book or this is a great poem, this is a great short story, is it's pulling on things that are, like, are, like, connected to you in your everyday life. They're vulnerable. Like, this story feels very honest, even if it's fiction. Or the author seems to, like, be connecting, like, outside of themselves. So I think part of that comes, like, I guess I hear part of the question is like, how do you write something interesting? Like, how do you come to the page and write something interesting? Honestly, I think it's being like vulnerable Mm -hmm. and being honest. Like, so if you're writing a a, a creative nonfiction piece or like a poem or something that is asking you to write something from a real perspective, like do that and do it in the most honest and vulnerable way. But if you're writing fiction, something that you're kind of creating or you're pulling from maybe a real life experience. Like I think I always tell my students, right. I feel like I'm contradicting. If, if they watch this, they're going to be like, Ms. Royston, you're contradicting <laughs> yourself. Cause I say, don't write for your reader, right? Like you're yep. writing for, for yourself. But I was going to say in fiction, like when you're thinking about putting this story together, you're crafting it. I think you think about like the realness of the characters or the realness of the story or this setting or this place that you're developing and how, a reader might connect to those things. And I think in fiction that it's okay to kind of make those connections in the writing process versus in creative nonfiction and um, poetry. I'm asking students to not do those things, to Mm -hmm. think about the readers that early. But long-winded, again, I feel like I'm a bit of a a talker, but I think (laughs) (laughs) it's, it's, I think when you think about when you're grabbed by a text, like I was saying earlier, it goes back to like the things that are connect, like, what's connecting you to that text? Like, is it the setting that feels so real or so vivid or the connection between the characters or like the honesty? And I think those things come from like very real places in the writer. So I think coming to the page to write something honest is like, how honest are you being about what you want to write? Like, is this something true or or real or experience based for you? And if it's completely fictionalized, you, you, I'm hoping you've done your research on this topic that you're writing about to give it that honest and real feeling. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. Vulnerability, honesty, it sounds so simple and it's what people do all day long on their personal rant text messages. Right. But when it comes to write a class for English, everyone's scratching their head. Like what, what do we do here? Right. And you're doing your everyday life. Yeah. You're doing your everyday life. How do you write the rant? And, um, that snap you sent right before you came to class, you know, like, yeah. yeah, it's honest. And, uh, I think that's, I think that's difficult maybe for students sometimes to wrap their minds around in an academic setting, yeah. um, which I think is a really good challenge because everything else at school is so rigid and seems so structured. But in English class, you're almost supposed to break out of that yeah. a bit. It's interesting. And I think like our like tri school bridges are well bridges in Bryn Mawr no more. I don't know as much about um Roland Park, but I think we do such a, a good job of creating like a a home in the classroom for students to do some of that, to feel comfortable doing that work of like mm-hmm. being honest and vulnerable on the page, even if it is writing through an analytical essay or like a creative work or just a group work where they're they're writing. I think part of that, the answer to the question that we're kind of talking around of like basically how do you write something good or or that people want to read is like space to like where are you writing this like how are you given the prompt for the those things so I was just saying I think at Gilman we do a great job of like providing a space where where students should feel comfortable to write Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now how did you get to Gilman because I know you're not from (laughs) you're not from the east coast right you're Uh, from LA maybe Mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm from Los Angeles um I, I had a mentor who's from the East Coast. He went to a, a Maryland and got his MFA the uh, in somewhere in maybe University of Maryland, is it? The, mm-hmm. Yeah, got got his MFA. And he just told me about like, oh, it's, a, it's an amazing school at Gilman. It's great opportunities. 
I'm not sure if you want to do a fellowship. At the time, I really thought that I was going to go and pursue a PhD in uh, creative writing. Um, so at this, I, I did my creative writing PhD applications, and I did a couple fellowship applications. Um, and I didn't get into the school of my choice, which I think is always, like, tough, like, trying to figure out, like, what happens after you don't, like, get your top choice. I think things that the students are dealing with just at a different level. So uh, I got into a, a, a few other PhD programs in, in some obscure places like Oklahoma, and I, I was unsure if I really wanted to, to live in Oklahoma. And um, at the same time, I guess what I'm skipping is I'm also doing the application process and interviews and, and things. And I, I came to Gilman, and I did my demo lesson, and I met faculty and, and things. And I just fell in love with the campus and the people here. And I think that the freedom Gilman allows me to teach creative writing. And um, I think it was an easy yes, because coming from my background is teaching um, teaching at the college level. So when you think of coming into uh, high school education, Gilman's a great place because of the skill level the students are at. So it was an easy yes, right, to say yes, like, oh, I want to do this mm -hmm. after, like, this trek and, and not do the PhD. It was, it was hard once I got here and once I, like, was, like, in this place to do it because, like you said, everything is so different from East Coast to West Coast, but... It's been a great, great time. I'm glad. Now, in your creative writing class, how's that going so far? Because you teach two semesters, right? First semester, yeah. second semester, different groups of students. Completely different groups of students, and I think it's it's been amazing. So um, my first semester, we wrapped about uh, six or seven weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and it was great, and I think I taught the class like I would generally teach a creative writing class, but the the way I teach creative writing is I always start in my genre, which is poetry, and I use the students' interests to kind of move through the rest of creative writing we can do. So that was great, and their experience in creative writing was amazing. And I think just because I am a poet and my assembly like happened to fall around the time I was teaching that section, we generally gravitated more towards poetry. And when we did our final reading at the end, they all read poetry, which like made me really happy. And um, I had a student like write a poem. Um, Nick Lutsky wrote a poem, A Golden Shovel, and that poem got um, won a prize. So I, I think read that. I liked it. The man, the man in the I forget what it was called, but I read that the other day when he sent it out. Yeah. He's talented. He was in my English class last year, and he really grew a lot. I think exactly. And as a writer, I talked to his advisor, and in no way I can take the credit for like molding Nick Lutsky in a writer because he was already. A writer but it makes me happy that I could teach like a form or a tool and that he can like write this amazing poem that someone else can read and say oh this is amazing mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. as a teacher it's almost like a, a pat on the back too so it's great I, I'm loving creative writing I think um, I talked about this with my section last year last semester and um, it's so interesting because the boys are so much more vulnerable as writers than like the um, the other two two schools which is always like really interesting and I think it's it goes back to this community and this like um this relationship Gilman has built with the boys to be like more like engaged with 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 each other but my new section is amazing new group of students new writers um I'm doing a new thing where I'm conferencing with all of the students before the end of quarter one to really like allow it to mold my uh class schedule as we go so mm -hmm. it's great, and I'm doing more collaborations. I had a collaboration with Mr. Baker's a songwriting section. I'm going to do a collaboration with Mr. Malkus, who is a playwriter. I think I know my skills as a writer, and I know like where I'm not like as skilled, and I want to reach all of the students' mm -hmm. desires in writing, so I'm trying to, That's to great. do that as much as possible. That's great. Now, what do they enjoy? What types of poets or writers do they enjoy reading? And you said that you like to have their input on where the class goes. So what, what where are they pushing or where, where have they pushed in um, the past? So one thing that, that, that I originally the class was uh, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, one act plays. They weren't interested in doing the one act plays first semester. So I scrapped that from the mm -hmm. schedule. So that's, that's one way that we pivoted. Um, 
versus this semester, uh, I have them do a reflectionary kind of thing day one. And a lot of students are interested in um, fiction, but specifically like short stories. I have some uh, Patrick Hervey who, who already writes short stories. So I have students who who have interest in specialties that they want to write. They don't give me a lot of input in terms of like writers that they mm -hmm. want. But what I try to do is like, uh, we just finished, we just wrapped love poems because why not do love poems in February? And I do like a, um, I do a doc with maybe 20 or 30 poems on there. And I let them like select one poem that they really like or to talk about. So in, in that way, they have like freedom to look at work. But I think, I think I should, probably should develop a way to kind of get their input on like authors that they would want to read to like incorporate but I haven't quite figured that part of it out mm -hmm. yeah so I just give them like a kind of an offering of a, a lot of different texts I like that that's good to give some choice yeah I think I keep it so. kind of contemporary too which some people might they might want more of like the canon type of poetry but I, I like to keep it I like to push against like what what can poetry be like what can it not be mm -hmm. so I think the songwriting is really interesting, too, and I've talked to a few people about that because music is all around, and, you know, you ask the students, how many of you guys like listening to music? Everyone's hand shoots up, and it's like, all right, well, that music is poetry, right? Exactly. You just haven't looked at it that way yet. Yeah. Um, so I have a prompt on my next, like, sheet of essays that I'm going to give. We just finished The Great Gatsby, and one of them is choose one of Taylor Swift's songs because she's so big right now. And a lot of her songs really do align with Gatsby because they're about love and they're about, you know, broken relationships and that kind of thing. Compare that song to something from The Great Gatsby. Yeah. You know, like bringing in the music and the contemporary stuff I think works really well. I think, and I completely agree with this, the, I think, and we talked about this in our class with Justin Baker, and I think, a musician or artist or someone like Taylor Swift who's like captivated the world can do this, but it's really hard. Like, like you said, she has a lot of poems about, I mean, a lot of poems, a lot of songs yeah. about the same thing, but that's a great thing about musicality because she can say the same thing seven different ways and just kind of like change the music behind it or the way mm -hmm. that it's being sung, but in like a short story or poetry or something, you, you almost have to, reinvent language every time you may want to talk about something that's similar in context. So I just think it's it's beautiful and different how those two like modes of writing work. In, yeah. mm -hmm. So book recommendations, if you're bringing two to three books to a desert island, that's all you get, or, po or poems or poetry yeah. um, collections, what are you taking? Because I've been reading all poetry now for the for the last like four months, I've only been reading poetry. Kind of number one recommendation is uh, this book called uh, Ordinary Beast by Nicole Seeley. It's a collection of poems. Came out maybe five years ago, so it's a, a little bit older, but that's one that I would highly recommend. Um, the Tradition by Jericho Brown, and all these po these books that I'm recommending are books that. Um, push against tradition or like poetry and um I'm going to butcher her last name but uh it's a a a, a collection called Incarnadine by Mary Sevis or Shevis or I, I I know for sure I'm pronouncing it incorrectly but amazing collection of poems that challenge me and also shape me these are things that I've read like over the last couple of years and I reread but has helped me in different ways to become a better writer. Now, in what ways do these collections push against like a traditional definition of poetry? Yeah, so uh, in Nicole Seeley's Ordinary Beasts, I, I love that book because it's a great book to look at when you think of collection. So not only is she writing like a lot of contemporary poems, she's writing a lot of poems that incorporate um, non-traditional and contemporary poetic forms. So forms, um, she has a form that she wrote called an obverse, and it's basically the poem inverts itself after the, um, I think it's the 14th or 15th line. Um, and, and in that, that obverse is also like an ephrastic piece. So using all of these traditional poetic forms to kind of like reinvent, she writes in the traditional sonnet, but she writes about um, 
I don't want to butcher the. Um, she writes about like the uh, the the era of like drag women and and things like that. So kind of like using this traditional form that was historically not for things that it's been written about to write into. Um, but it also has everything that a book should have. It has poems about identity. It has love poems. It has poems about like historical movements. So I like that you get a bit of the tradition, but also it's like, whoo, like how else can you like, mm -hmm. right. Um, there is a, um, I think there might be a huzzle in there, which is like a traditional mm -hmm. poetic form. Um, maybe like a Sistina. So a lot of different, but it's also great because you can read those things and, and not, not not even know that they're poetic forms. I think those are for people who like really need to know. But one of my favorite collections. So they're using the poetic form, but the content maybe is pushing against. Yeah. Tr it's more so the content than the form. Exactly for some things for like the 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 one about the sonnet where she's writing. Um, it's a series of sonnets dedicated to uh, a Paris uh, Paris is burning that. Um, that documentary where it's dedicated to um, drag and trans women from that time. And for me, I think like, it's just so interesting to take like this, like historic form that was like definitely not created to talk about these kinds of things mm -hmm. and to like write into that. And then she has a form that she creates. She has an erasure. She writes one poem. And then on the, on the next page, it's an erasure of the poem that she just wrote. Oh yeah. Yeah. And she just wrote, uh, Nicole Seeley just published, I think either 2024 or 2023, the Ferguson Report, where she does an erasure of um, the Ferguson Report that, that just came out and, and took the entire report and created like 10 different poems out of just like erasing hmm. the, the report. Interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting. All right. Well, I'm excited for... Um to hear more about your class. It sounds like it's going pretty well. You've got a good group of students and you're exploring some new things. So I, I need to mix some more poetry into my class. I've done it in the past and I've, I don't know, maybe I've chose too many books this year and we're just bogged down with books, but. I've heard a great thing about Mr. Scott's class for my students. Thank so. you. Thank you. Yeah. It's fun. So thank you for coming in and uh, talking a little bit about poetry pretty easy right pretty, yeah pretty easy pretty I, I appreciate it I'm, I'm glad that you said this is something that I should do so yeah it feels great thank you so much thank you thank you Chesra thank you have a good long weekend you too